Hi, I'm Stephen Hebert. I'm a senior TAM at AWS, and I'm based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Welcome to AWS Supports You, where AWS support experts provide tips to optimize performance in the cloud, lower costs, and provide you with the best practices and design considerations. Joining me today are Kellyanne, Ankit, and Louis uh, from AWS Support. Can you give us all a quick introduction? Definitely. Hi, everyone. I'm myself, Kalyan Janaki. I'm a senior big data and analytics special, a specialist from AWS Enterprise Support. Day in, day out, I work helping customers with the big data services like EMR, Glue, Athena, MSK, and ensure they're following best practices and optimizing their operations in cloud. I would go ahead to Louis to introduce himself. Cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Louis. Um, I'm in the same team as both Ankit and Kalyan. I'm a big data and analytics specialist. Also, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, helping customers out on achieving operational excellence on their streaming platforms and also some data warehousing using Amazon Redshift. Cool. Ankit? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ankit. Um, working with AWS based out of Berlin. My background is in big data and engineering. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Today, we'll be introducing you to MSK, Amazon Managed Streaming uh, for Apache Kafka, uh, will specifically focuses focus on the operational best practices around MSK. Before we get into the details, a quick note to the attendees online. Use the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen to let us know where you're joining us from today and share your thoughts and questions throughout the episode. We look forward to hearing from you. We'll also provide a link to the survey, so if you'd like to let us know how we did, please click on the link and leave us your feedback. Uh, Kalyan, this is a, an area I don't have a lot of experience in. So can you start us off? No problem, Stephen. Uh, firstly, I really want to stress that thanks for letting customers know who are on the show to keep questions. We are ready to answer any questions that you might have. Love to answer those questions. So let's go with a quick agenda. We're going to start off a session to talk about what's Kafka and how can MSK help for Kafka users. And then we're going to touch the best practices sections like right-sizing your Kafka clusters, security best practices, monitoring, performance, and cost optimization. And we're going to have a separate section for Q&A, but we'd love to he hear your questions over chat and answer them whenever we want to immediately as they appear on the chat. So let's before we get into session, let's start with a very quick introduction about Apache Kafka. Ankit, do you want to take some time and talk what's an Apache Kafka is? Yes, you can learn. Uh, Apache Kafka is an uh, open source distributed streaming platform with uh, three uh, core uh, capabilities, uh, publish and subscribe stream of the records, store, store records in more fault tolerant way, process the record as they occur. Uh, Apache Kafka uh, widely used for the asynchronous uh, processing of the events, and it can be fanned out to the thousand number of consumers without actually impacting the underneath performance. Uh, common use cases of Apache Kafka are real-time analytics, transaction and event sourcing, messaging, and microservices in which you can use Apache Kafka as a messaging queue and publish messages to messaging queue and subscribe the messages from uh, messaging queue and uh, it can work as a synchronous way. Then we have use cases a streaming ETL and metrics and log aggregation and it can be easily uh, connect with the different sources and destinations like databases, data warehouses, and uh, we have this uh, data lake and NoSQL databases. Thank you, Ankit. As Ankit said, the, the Kafka has become very much a, like a de facto standard in many enterprises as an enterprise messaging bus, right? So what are the use cases that have been displayed here on the screen? They are, it's not limited to that, right? The use cases are very abundant. It's just that we cannot fit everything on the screen here. So as we see the rapid adoption of Kafka, Let's talk about what are the challenges challenges of operating an Apache Kafka, right? As Ankit said, Kafka is a distributed system. It means you are the, it's a it's a system that's distributed across multiple servers. So as coming to any distributed system, the setup is very difficult, and the scaling is very tricky, right? So because you need to maintain so that your nodes are up and run, so you need to take care of the high availability so that one of your node goes down, you need to ensure the bringing up the node, right? And then Kafka alone cannot uh, solve all your business problems, right? You need 
a producer to send message you need a consumers to consume from you need authentication authorization you need enterprise grade security right and then managing such kind of complex distributed system is not easy and it comes with so much of expensive to maintain it right you need a very deep expertise of site reliability engineers to manage a big distributed apache kafka cluster looking at all these challenges aws actually introduced a managed streaming for apache kafka service uh, so basically what does amazon msk does for you so amazon msk is a managed streaming for open source apache kafka with this with a few clicks on the aws console you will have an msk cluster ready so it takes automatically provisions and configures the infrastructure for you so that your teams can concentrate on shipping the products and streaming applications or whatever it is fast to the market and aws takes care of the responsibility of managing your cluster infrastructure right it it ensures it follows all the typical best practices like ensuring the broker node is being replaced ensuring providing you an options to secure your cluster all possible secure configurations and we are using completely open source so the msk the kafka cluster you get as part of amazon msk is fully compatible with open source and so yeah. it Sorry, Kelly. So, if I'm if I'm following correctly, like it really what we're doing is, and it does seem like, and I've looked at some of this before. For me, at least, it's a very complex thing to set up and get running. So, it looks like we really just take a lot of that complexity and work it right out, and then you can just click the button almost and deploy it, and really just focus on what you want to develop, what you need to deploy here on this. this exactly, right? So if you don't have MSK, you need to, let's take example of cloud, right? You need to manage those EC2 instances. You need to patch them. You need to upgrade the software. You need to monitor the health of those instances and so that bring back the instances, one of the instances go down. There's so much of complexity, right? And MSK is pretty much removing all that complexity for our customers, right? So, with, so, so MSK is taking care of that. All customer needs to is to bring up the cluster create the topics and deploy their applications right so so now that uh, msk is providing this service to customers let's talk about what are a few best practices they need to follow before they move into production or after they move into production uh, for kafka applications using amazon msk right the first best practices that we want to talk today is right sizing your msk cluster right even before you go into production we would want you to right size your cluster right so when you when you right size your cluster you might be eliminating lot of future challenges either in the way you don't over provision your cluster or you don't under provision your cluster so that you provision it according to your expected workload so that uh, you don't face any adverse issues when you go to production so so, for, so yeah. okay, it, it, does that but there is still an element of automatic scaling that can happen right yeah, it's not about automatic scaling. It's it, we have two different services here. Thanks for bringing that question, Stephen. Right. So within an MSK, we have two different services: MSK serverless and MSK provision. Right. With MSK provision, we customers are expected to launch a cluster with a fixed set of broker nodes, and they can scale up the cluster and scale down the cluster with a single click on a console. Okay, but it's not automatic. Right. So if if you are having a workload where you expect very very, very ranging throughput over a day. We do have a service MSK serverless, where in which it can scale up and scale down automatically, and you don't have to manually scale the cluster there. So MSK serverless would be the answer for your question, basically. So, so you could actually start, if you don't know what this is gonna look like, what the shape is yep. of the workload, then you could start with serverless, yes. run it for a while, figure it out, and then move to more provisioned if you wanna get a little more granular in that. Exactly, control. exactly, right? <laughs> and uh, we also see a huge number of customers who are actually migrating to MSK from their on-prem or self-managed Kafka clusters, right? So this might be a very suitable session for them because they are already operating Kafka. They know uh, how, to op how to use Kafka and how to design those topics and internals, but they need some information on the best practices with respect to MSK, basically, yeah? So so now that we speak about right sizing, I provided a link on the documentation. So it, it, this, link is, this link is also part of AWS MSK best practices documentation, where we created a worksheet for you. I'm gonna share my screen here, which provides the worksheet. So basically in this uh, Excel sheet that I'm sharing on my screen, uh, this has been designed by AWS experts to give you a ballpark figure so you may have to give an inputs like uh, what because kafka being a 
streaming service where in which you are providing lot of input data and consuming the data throughput plays a significant role right so you might have to enter the you were some of the inputs like what is your ingestion rate how much you want to put data and what is your replication factor of your topics right and what what is your retention period by entering few few parameters here it's going to give you the details about what would be the right cluster for you to choose right so for examples that i have provided here this excel sheet is going to give you that m5x large instance type with a six brokers would be a right choice for my use case right so i would want all customers to utilize this uh, sheet to get a ballpark figure to right size their, cl their clusters so there could be still some nu nuances here and there but yes this disk will place as a first role giving you a good very good ballpark and what how do you right size your cluster i'm going back to on my slides another important resources that i wanted to provide customers and right sizing is this good blog that we published right so <clears throat> Kafka being a distributed system with so much of data replication, data in and data out happening, as you can see, it's nothing but a bunch of broker servers communicating between them and also messages coming in and messages going out, right? So for, for, for if you have a very high throughput use cases, so how do you calculate what would be the right, how do you right size the cluster is using the formula that displayed on the slide, right? So we would be also be providing the link that on the slide on the chat here, for the what would be the the this is a, a detailed blog with a GitHub link to how you can do a performance testing to optimize the sizing of your cluster based upon the throughput requirements. So generally, the throughput hitting limits for Kafka cluster would come would be either a storage limits or EBS network because MSK is utilizing an EC2 and EBS. It is using EBS storage underlying. So so the, the throughput that you get is maxed based upon the storage throughput the EBS network throughput, and finally, the EC2 network throughput. The network capacity depends upon okay. the type. Yep. Sorry, Kenny. So this is going to, that blog post will help kind of outline how to put the right figures in this math, because this is a exactly. lot of math for me. Yeah, there's so much of math. I understand it gets complex. That's <laughs> the reason I, I, I put the link there. So the link, this, this entire formula and right sizing itself could become a one hour long session. Right, so yeah. that's the reason. It it if you if do this is if you have only extremely extreme high throughput use cases, but otherwise, initial first step is the using those Excel sheet because it's very simple and straightforward. Otherwise, you can use the more detailed and comprehensive. This blog is actually a comprehensive resource on how to optimize your right sizing cluster based upon your throughput. Yeah, I would like customers to spend time both on the the sizing sheet we gave previously and also this blog before they move to production and right size their clusters. And the next next uh, best practice following on right sizing is choosing the right number of partitions, right? So MSK comes with some limits on the maximum number of partitions you can have per broker instance based upon the type of instance type, right? The table here is displayed, shows number of the, the limit for each the limit of number of partitions partitions are like a physical units of your messaging system in the kafka and there is a limit on based upon instance type right so, so we yep go ahead so with the the partitions and and it, it, some people may not it, it's including myself be familiar with some of the like what would be a typical way to partition this or why would you you know yep. in those in that messaging how what's yep. typically something people would use so basic unit of uh, is in Kafka is typically a topic, right? A topic is consists of multiple partitions, okay? So pa partition is a factor of uh, scalability uh, in Kafka, right? The more partitions you have, the more scalability you get, right? Because um, your number of partitions are distributed. Basically, your topic is distributed based upon number of partitions, right? But to top number of partitions is also a limiting factor because the too many number of partitions create issues like slow slow broker restart time, okay, slow maintenance mm -hmm. issues, and failover takes a lot of time. That's the reason we have provided the limits based upon the instance capacity type. And often we see some issue with customers is they, some of the customers, they don't follow a right strategy to choose the number of partitions per topic. Right, so we want them to follow a good strategy. There are there is no single straightforward strategy to follow choosing the right number of partitions. It is depending upon their throughput. Right, so you might have a organization with so many events like customer create event and customer purchase event. Right, depending upon the 
type of the event and the throughput requirements design the partitions accordingly without going with the default number of partitions for every topic that you create right so that so in that case that example like customer create that would be a topic yep. and then based upon how much you're getting how many of those requests and things you're getting then you're going to determine the number of partitions yes. but you could have too much of a good thing and make too many partitions and and uh, impact your performance as well like, Exactly right. So, so you, it's it's not about performance impact. It's about like you are limiting the number of topics because we have a hard limit on number of partitions you can have based okay. upon the instance type. Uh, you met uh, you that, that limits number of topics you can use your cluster. It's like underutilized, right? If you really creating too many partitions for for lower throughput requirements, it's like you are you are making the cluster underutilized basically. Yeah. Okay. So these are the three factors that you consider before like right sizing your cluster and also right sizing your partitions and number of topics before move on to your production right and then we go on to the next topic here the next best practice is about securing your msk clusters ankit we want to do you want to talk about how to secure msk uh, yes kalyan uh, security is our highest high prior, highest priority at aws and uh, msk security is categorized into four parts encryption authentication authorization and last we have network level security encryption we have encryption at rest and encryption in transit encryption at rest uh, it uses kms key to encrypt that data by default is enabled encryption in transit is uses tls 1.2 that's a transport layer security protocol this extended version of ssl uh, there's two level of encryption we supports uh, here in msk and then we have authentication uh, first one we have unauthenticated if you don't want to uh, enable authentication then you can use unauthenticated for development or test environment and then we have im and mutual tls tls and sasl scrm im uh, is support both authentication and authorization and is free of cost and easy to use you can just you just need to define set of uh, json based policies and in which uh, provide all of the resource details and uh, it can be easily used with the other aws services and it only supports the jira client and the clients who we support im mutual tls is a transport layer security protocol it uses transport layer security protocol to authenticate and uh, underneath is uses acm that's the aws certificate uh, manager and uh, this uh, uses private pca basically private certificate authority to authorize your particular certificate uh, mutual tls best use case if you are migrating your existing kafka workload from on prem to aws then if, if it is already there this then is just like lift and shift then what we have sasl scrm uh, it uses underneath uh, uh, it stores basically the creds and uh, it uses sha512 hashing algorithm to uh, hash that particular credentials and uh, move in transit and uh, there are few limitations of it like you can only store 1000 number of uh, users credentials in it and it is the best case uh, if uh you have something like uh if you are moving your uh, uh, particular client application from one machine to another machine then every time you don't need to change uh, your credentials so all of the credentials get stored into uh, aws uh, secret manager uh let me quickly bring my screen y yes so yes. Can, yeah can you um for for that is there also i assume then we they could use uh certificate manager to manage these as well Yes. So, as I said, right, Stephen. Uh, you, thanks for bringing this point because this gives me an opportunity to 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 tell customers how, how we are making it so easy with MSK, right? So, look at the deeper integration with other AWS ecosystem, right? If they choose mutual TLS authentication, it's tightly integrated with ACM, right? They don't need a separate service for certificate management. So, MSK directly works with uh, AWS ACM for mutual TLS, right? And if they want to use the SASL scram password-based authentication. we are tightly integrated with aws secrets manager they don't need another secure system to store their passwords right so the so the sa uh, the sasl or scram mm -hmm. that's really 
from that's another mechanism for managing those secrets and and we so can use secrets. SASL management. scram is a method of authentication. Okay, it's an authentication mechanism which uses it username password based model. So the username and passwords that you want cluster to use would be saved in AWS Secrets Manager. So basically, Kafka underlying makes use of Secrets Manager to to use so that when, whenever a user enters the credentials, they are queried against Secret Manager to test them. Okay, okay. go ahead. You can share your screen. Uh, you want to show yeah. how to how different options there? Yeah, let and me we do. Thanks. And um, thanks for bringing that up. I guess we do have a question. Um, Coming in here from uh, just just one underscore. Uh, what's the the best method recommended to authenticate with the cluster? So there is no such thing as best method here. Thanks for first. Firstly, thanks for asking that question. We love questions from customers. There's, there's no just the best method here. So we just want to provide so many options. I would tell an advantage of one over other, right? Ankit, you can pitch in if you are interested anytime. Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, the advantage of IAM is generally we see many customers who migrate to MSK. The, all the external applications like producer applications or consumer applications, we you, we see them being deployed in. Other AWS services like EC2 or Fargate container, right? So if your application is directly, we see them very flexible for them to use IAM authentication, right? They don't have to manage in ACM certificates. They don't have to share passwords. As with any customers who are using AWS, the IAM is simple and straightforward. You go ahead, create a policies, and it just works, boom, right? So... So for the sake of flexibility, if your applications are already running in AWS and they're all the clients based upon Java, IAM is highly suggested. But if you already have invested in your on-premise or like you are trying to migrate your on-prem cluster where you're already using mutual TLS or SASL scram, you can you can automatically use the same thing. Yeah. So so you may not have a best method, but you've got a favorite. You got the, my favorite is IAM. <laughs> my favorite is IAM. If as long as customers are using Java applications within an AWS, yeah. Yeah, my my favorite is uh, IAM as too because uh, what's the best part of it is actually stores all of the details that you perform at the top of the cluster, and that you get uh, inside CloudTrail. Yes, so you get a big better audit. All of the IAM. details, yeah. like yeah. Mm -hmm. And so other thing is like. As Ankit was explaining you, right? So if you use IAM, it takes care of both authentication and authorization. But if you're going for mutual TLS or SASL scram, uh, you would need again an ACLs management for authorization because those methods are only helping you for authentication. And, and, and this there applies. Is some, yeah, extra Sorry. cost also involved for this mutual TLS. Yep. When you use uh, mutual TLS for certificate manager, um, uh, approximate uh, 400 USD you need to pay for one month. So. IAM is free to use as well. Yeah, Ankit, I think so, you should you should start creating cluster and show the options on cluster. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as you go, as you're going through that, and and I guess these these op same options apply whether it's serverless or the provisioned models, right? No, this this one we are talking only about provision. We're not oh, talking provision. about okay. serverless. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Serverless is all again totally a different thing. We can have definitely another session to talk about MSK serverless. Yeah, <coughs> yeah let's get started. Um, I just selected custom create and then provided a cluster name. That's a demo cluster one. Here we have two options for cluster type. I selected the previous provision one. Then uh, Kafka version 2.8.1. That's the this I'm using. Uh, number of zones, we have three. Then broker per zone one. Uh, EBS volume, um, uh, that's uh, 100 gigs. Then if you have any uh, configurations, you can provide. I'm moving with the default one. Here, I have dedicated VPC. Uh, availability zone. Then we have private subnet. Uh, private subnet for zone two. Private subnet for zone three. Here, I'm reviewing default security group and going to select dedicated security group for my msk cluster then we have all of these options security option so here as as i said like uh, when you use this tls you you can use aws private ca uh, for the certificates uh, and uh, sasl scrm and uh, iam and other 
And best part of it, you can use multiple authentication method. So in the end, what it will do, it will uh, provide you different port numbers to access cluster. And uh, moving to encryption, uh, here we have TLS encryption, encryption addressed. You, if you don't provide, it will automatically select this one. And then you can use uh, uh, managed key if you if you want to your, want to use your own managed key. Yeah. So this is how you can create cluster. I, th I think um, just one thing I want to mention there as well um, that with MSK it also supports Terraform, and so you can do um, like proper infra code for it, and obviously you can use the cloud formation as well. And Kalyan, I believe the CDK um, is also supported for um, for MSK as well. Yep, I think so. So I think uh, that's that's the demo to display the different security configurations that you have on options. I think we'll go back onto the slide deck here. Uh, so as uh, Ankit spoke, two types of like we first spoke to you about data security. So your data is secured in transit and rest. Then we gave you different options for user security, right? For both authentication and authorization. And the next part of security is your network security. So MSK cluster can be launched inside your separate VPC. So you can have it uh, running it in your private subnets and you can completely control the security by using the security group. Basically, uh, so you can only allow uh, the security the security group to uh, co connections only from your producer and consumer applications. So it looks like we have a question. Yes, we do. Um, from uh, Zone Autumn, uh, do you have Terraform modules only for the brokers or also for the topics and Kafka users? Uh, uh, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, so currently uh, we have Terraform modules only for the infrastructure, not for the internal applications. So you still have to use Kafka APIs to create uh, topics and users. Uh, the Terraform support currently provides you to create the MSK infrastructure. Cool. Thanks for the question though. So now that so now that we spoke about as a first step, right size your cluster. Second step, what is called secure your cluster. After you right sized and secured, deploy, start deploying your workloads. The next thing we're going to talk about is monitoring your cluster. Right now that you've deployed your applications, it's very important you need to monitor. And we have our expert, Louis, who is going to talk, talk about best practices with monitoring. Cool. Thank you, Kalyan. Um, yeah, so when it comes to monitoring workloads and stuff, I can get quite crazy obsessive with diving into the into the metrics and stuff like that. Um, so when it comes to Kafka, so this we've got quite a few approaches how you can start the monitoring. So you can go with the AWS native approach using CloudWatch, which can include the metrics on the three levels you are used to when looking at these metrics. We're looking at the broker level, the topic level, and partition level. One important note there is if you want deeper level of insights on the topic and partition level, it will cost you extra. Just something to be aware of. But there are some metrics out of the box already free of charge that you can use. Um, so I would say when to use CloudWatch. Um, if you are already using CloudWatch for most of your workloads and you just want a simple, quick, out of the box type of monitoring solution, then it can definitely be much easier to set up. Um, then the other option is um, is open monitoring. So open monitoring uh, is basically Kafka uses open monitoring with Prometheus, which is the popular time series monitoring system that I believe many customers are familiar with. And the cool thing about the open monitoring pieces is, is if you if your existing monitoring stack is already compatible with Prometheus, or you are also using um, existing third-party providers such as your lenses, Datadog, New Relic, and all those um, type of third, third parties, then you can also, um, yeah, then it's probably easier to um, integrate Kafka with open monitoring for your existing stack as well. And so then, little, yeah, go yeah with that, I guess a, a, a couple of things there. It, it's probably good to start, especially if you don't know everything you want to monitor, start with the, the what's provided by default and, and go from there, right? To, to yep. kind of try things yeah. out and and get a sense before turning on everything. I know some some teams like to just turn everything on and, and take all these metrics and then you don't know where to go. Yep. Yeah, so and the session would there be go with those default metrics and also at least go per broker metrics in the initially. Uh, and then uh, as you progress, then you can start thinking about enabling per topic and per, per partition metrics, yeah. Go ahead, Louis. 
Cool. Yeah, and just one final piece on this. Also, um, you can stream your Kafka broker logs as well to other destinations. Um, so you can stream it to your CloudWatch logs. You can put it into Amazon S3 where you can run any type of analytics tool that integrates with um, a JWC type of drive or so on the S3 bucket or via the API calls. Um, or you can um, stream it to open search as well. And you can use Kinesis Fio to this. So if you've got some operation analytics, you can use open search um, on these mm -hmm. log details as well. Looks so like we have a question. Zone, right? Yeah, Zone Autumn asks, uh, can you define custom metrics? Um, yes. No. Yes. So oh. no, what, what, what I wanted to say about the custom metric pieces, um, how, just to understand the question, you can, like say for example, in CloudWatch, you can define something called metric math, where you can combine some metrics to create your own. And when you have like Pr um, Prometheus, for example, you can do the similar thing. And I'm gonna quickly give you an example like on CPU usage. So when you look at CPU usage in Kafka, there's usually two metrics we recommend you need to keep an eye on. And I'm going to cover more on the monitoring details in a bit. But basically, you want to keep an eye on your um, user CPU usage and your system CPU usage. And one way to create a custom metric is basically you can create some math just to add those together as an aggregate. And then you can, um, yeah, and then you can monitor that. So to, so to, deep, you, to you, dive deep into the answer what uh, for the question of custom metrics, all the metrics that come for you, if you are selecting CloudWatch, by default, it, uh, MSK provides you a set of metrics Okay, that cannot be changed. But if you're using open monitoring for Prometheus, you're going to get all the JMX metrics, right? Kafka is yeah. a Java-based system. You're going to get all the JMX metrics that the typical uh, open source Kafka provides to you. But you cannot customize the Kafka or you cannot provide any custom thing, custom jar file there to export additional metrics. So basically, you're going to get all JMX metrics provided as part of Kafka. So you couldn't instrument the application to kind of have your own metric that you're 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 passing along. No, no, you can't do that. But yeah, but as mentioned before, if there's some type of flexibility you need for some custom, then you can do your own math on using what's there already to create a, a third type of metric. Cool. Also, we would love to understand, uh, Zone Autumn, we'd love to understand what kind of custom metric uh, you are looking for. We would like to take it over to my service team if it looks like a good requirement and uh, put it as a feature request. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Go ahead, Louis. Uh, cool, yeah, so now I want to say, yeah, so now we're going to move on to monitoring and just look at some of the important metrics. Um, so Kafka can be a bit of a vast ecosystem and there are loads of metrics. If you go to the official Apache Kafka um, docs as well, you will see there's tons of metrics. These important ones I just want to um, try and cover today with you because these are also the most common um, metrics we also recommend you start with because they can definitely help you investigate a lot of um, performance related or any type of Kafka workload um, me metrics you're after. Um, and just to try and simplify it um, to get a better understanding of these metrics. We try to break it up into three primary categories. So on the left, you have your broker metrics. And then on the right, you've got your producer and your consumer metrics. And I'm just going to, I've actually created a small um, POC my end. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen with using open monitoring. Um, and before I dive into some of these me metrics, um, Stephen, if you could share a link to the to the um, customers the, uh, um, about our open monitoring blog. So I spent quite a few a bit of time of creating this um, this dashboard, and three days ago or so, we launched a blog with everything pre-built and made. Um, so you could actually, if you go to that blog, there's cloud formation templates, there's um, ready-made Grafana dashboards for your MSK cluster, which gives you pretty much exactly what you're looking at here, yeah, a full suite of all the monitoring metrics you need. Cool. Um, so let me just go back to some of the metrics and say why is it important. So if I just scroll a bit down to the CPU usage here. So usually when you look at the CPU usage, right? So Kafka's primary bottleneck is mostly memory related. And for example, even when you even use compression, when compression is enabled, such as GZIP or so, your CPU is still not really the performance problem. So therefore, when you see spikes in CPU utilization, it's always a good thing to keep an eye on that. And a good threshold we have seen across many customers that, that is worked fairly well, and I know it's highly dependent on the workload, is if you set alarms so your CPU usage won't exceed like a 60% or so. 
for the threshold. So, um, it, it, yeah, just taking a taking a step back first um, with the the metrics, I guess. So, Zone Autumn once would, is asking. Uh, they saw the controller count metric there. Does MSK use a separate Zookeeper cluster under the hood, or does it use a post Kafka 3.0 broker no. uh, controller M cluster? MSK uses a separate Zookeeper cluster for each MSK, yeah. and that's included as part of your MSK pricing. Yes, okay. we we take uh, that's one of the advantages, right? Kafka needs Zookeeper in the past, or like I know we have a new version of Kafka where you doesn't need Zookeeper, but currently yes, MSK doesn't support the newer one. So currently we support uh, MSK all all versions of MSK comes with uh, uh, a separate Zookeeper cluster maintained on behalf of you. But eventually we'll we'll come up and, and support that as well. We'll have to look for the service team update on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The question I had there, uh, Louis, with the, your your metric and the that stood out to me operationally. Um, that percentage seems pretty low as a as a threshold. So um, I guess is that is that going? What, what's that kind of going back to? At least for me, from an operation standpoint, I it's, I want to see that metric. Louis is be, Louis Louis is loving his cluster and not putting lots of load on. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll quickly quick explain that. So um, so as mentioned before, so the sixty percent is something we we fairly common see which works pretty well. And um, so, so setting alarms over that 60% is a really good, inter, um, it's a really good approach to try and just be on top of things to make sure your cluster is operating healthy. And Kyle, um, and Kalyan can also talk, talk a, a bit about um, more about that. But one of the key things around the 60% is also imagine you've got three brokers, right? Imagine one of them fails. Now your other two brokers need to do a lot of processing to make up for that. So if your, all your brokers were already on the 80% or so and one fails and now two use needs to work extra hard, then your CPU utilization is going to be really high. So 60% is what we saw is just a, a safe way of, um, of, of um, working with. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, just a quick question for Kellyanne actually. Do you, Kellyanne, can you? Talk through a bit about some of the areas customers could potentially investigate if they see high CPU usage. Yep, definitely, Louis. Right, as you said, uh, monitoring CPU is important. As you said, uh, you you really brought in very important topic about balancing the cluster. Right, Kafka being a distributed system, we want you to have a well balanced load across your Kafka cluster. Right, and Louis clearly explained you why you need sixty percent because in a distributed system. You need an AZ level high availability, and if one of the AZ goes, the rest the, the broker nodes in other AZ needs to handle that load of the third AZ, right? That's why we we come up with that kind of number. But you need to always take take care of it based upon your different workload. Coming back to the Louis question of what are a few things that could have CPU impact is if you see high CPU. Some of the common issues that we see is about customer implementing compression at the broker side instead of client side, right? If you are, yes, you should compress the messages. We love it because you save so much on the storage side if you compress, but compression is a CPU intensive operation and you can, mm -hmm. you can do it at the producer side instead of putting that load on the broker, right? Another one of the common issues that we see in production with customers spiking CPU is the connection management, right? Mm -hmm. If they are using any third party client applications, and if that library is not patched and they have issues with TCP. Uh, recently, as I was working with a customer who was using a Fluent bit to send the logs to Kafka, right? The Fluent bit had an issue. I don't remember the version, unfortunately, where we had to patch it, where it was constantly doing a TCP purging, right? So it was not maintaining the standard TCP connections and there was so much of TCP churn. So too much of TCP churn can hit CPU. And yeah. so, so we would want you to monitor that. In, in that, we've got uh, Stu Montana uh, wants to know, Louis, if they're struggling with the CPU scaling events, would it be a good use case for serverless? That's a good question. And I question. assume serverless MSK. That's a good question. So if you're struggling with the CPU, that's what I said, right? CPU scaling events generally happen. You need to see what, as as Louis clearly initially said, <laughs> Kafka is not CPU intensive, typically yeah. as an application, right? So you are... You, um, the MSK serverless is mostly helping you for the sake of throughput, wherein which for, for eight hours on your business, you're going to pump 100 MB per second. And during a non-business hours, you're going to pump 5 MB per second, right? But if it's MSK provisioned, you need to always provision the cluster for 100 MBPS. But yeah. if it's MSK serverless, you are charged only based upon your throughput. That's where it plays a bigger role. 
so I think it, for for Stu Montana, it's if they're having issues with the CPU scaling, that that's something that probably needs more investigation. Yes. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be more of a troubleshooting type of exercise and understanding the use case and some peak events or something that's causing it. But I think also um, the MSK serverless, um, when you start considering between provision and serverless, obviously that goes completely based on not use, usually your CPU type of scaling, but rather the use case you're dealing with. Um, if it's on a more ad hoc type of on demand type of basis or so on. But as Kyle mentioned before, I'm not going to go too depth into that because it's a complete top topic on its own. But thanks for that question. But thanks. yes, cool. if your CPU is an issue, it's not about MSK serverless won't be the direct answer. You need to yeah. investigate the issue. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, and also um, Kafka, what Kafka also do, it um, because it... Um, deals with all these logs and such and on and and did um and the bytes in and bytes out of all these messages it persists persists all this data um to disk so obviously measuring disk usage is also fairly important metric and we've seen a lot of customers run into any disk space issues on the kafka clusters as well this was quite a really common issue we have seen and some of the thresholds around the storage space type of thing also what we seem to work fairly well is if you look at if if you set alarms when your storage is exceeding about 85% or so. And, um, and just looking at these metrics here, like I said, there's a fairly low workload. So most of all these ones are 94% still disk space available. But this just show you that you can definitely try and keep an eye on across all, all these things. And when you look at the blog post with those dashboards, it will pretty much be set up for you. Um, but I've also um, got a question for you, Kalyan, on the on the disk size sort of thing. So I know with some of the customers you've worked with as well, when they had some disk issues and stuff, there are some good mitigation methods around this as well. Can you walk me through a few to try and avoid disk, disk space issues? Sure, Louis. So if at all we we take top five issues customers face with, like the customer unnoticed and suddenly face in production that we see, one of them in the top five is the, the, the disk space hitting 100%, right? As you say, Kafka could be as a streaming system. It is like sending so much of data in. So... So the moment the disk hits 100%, so it's go, you're going to have a uh, side effects on your Kafka cluster. That's why we, so we, there's something that you can mitigate is uh, AWS MSK provides you an option to auto scale your uh, storage, right? Because the, so that you can have a CloudWatch alarm and implement that auto scaling of underlying EBS volume. So whenever you're hitting your threshold, right? As Luis was suggesting a 85% could be good threshold or the, it's, it's not about a one number, right? You can have your, your you can choose your threshold based upon type of the workload you might get, right? And so second thing you might have to think about also is, are you choosing a right retention period for your cluster, right? Mm. So the default retention period is seven days, but do you really need seven days of data to be saved on the cluster, right? Because uh, currently uh, AWS MSK can, the storage can only be scaled out, but it cannot be scaled in. So once you scale out, it's gonna stay there forever. So. Uh, one retention, choosing a right retention period is also going to help you uh, with not hitting this 100% of uh, storage and keep uh, keep scaling the storage forever. It, if So if you wanted to, to keep that around, but not necessarily, you'd offload that to somewhere else, right? If you needed that to keep that, yep. keep that data, that storage. Exactly. Yeah. Louis, over to you. Sure. Um, yeah, just some other metrics just, just want to go through. I know just a bit mindful of the time, so I'll try my best to get through some of these metrics. So another one, um, which is also fairly important, um, as mentioned before, Kafka is quite, um, it, it's usually performance bottleneck by memory. So, um, so one of the key things to measure in Kafka as well is the heap memory of the garbage collection metric. Um, that's definitely some, something um, to be aware of. And also thresholds recommendations around this piece is also setting alarms when something is exceeding 60%. Again, not a very hard um, requirement there, but just a good, a good threshold to work with. And then finally, just all looking at some of the networking aspects and so. So the goal of Kafka brokers, as you know, is to gather and move all these vast amounts of data for processing, right? If you've got millions of data points, it can be a, a source for very high network traffic. So 
just one thing to to keep in um, consideration is always trying to monitor the network activity of your brokers as well. Two common key metrics that you can, which is a great way to actually cross-reference as well, is the network request rates and the network error rates. Network request rate is your actual number of network requests per second that can actually help you determine if you need to scale the number of brokers or not. So that can really help with the sizing part of it. And also if you have any latency issues. Um, so, so if you see on your network requests, you have got some a decrease in a lot of your throughput, but you've got an increase of your error rate on the right, then that could help indicate um, if you actually need to scale up your data consumers or if there's specific network requests that's giving errors. I'm just showing a high overview of the network errors, but you can have specific um, work um, finer grain on the network level where it's packet loss or specific request type um, ha having some issues. Um, and just one, <laughs> there's quite a few. I'm just going to spend one more. Um, just the active control account. If I just scroll to the top, part of high level type of metrics. So your active controller. So the first broker in your Kafka cluster to boot is automatically the controller, and there can only be one. So um, the controller in your cluster is basically responsible for maintaining the list of your partition leaders and also coordinating leadership transitions in the event your partition leader becomes unavailable. So just looking at this graph, you can see there's only one controller. This broker three is the one that's been the controller and all the others are the followers. Um, yeah, but I hope this is useful. Um, I'll pass it back to you, Kellyan. Thank you. So we'll go back to our slide share now. So now that we talked about best, practice, best practices with monitoring, next thing we're going to see is cost optimization, right? We would love our customer to optimize their costs, right? We want them to optimize their workload and don't pay for, an, as a cloud, you have to optimize and then you don't have to pay for something that is not of your use, right? So right sizing your cluster is very important. Next thing is uh, you can use cruise control for partition management, right? So Kafka being a high heavy throughput systems, we want your cluster to be well balanced. So your entire load is well distributed across all your broker nodes. If you think your cluster is going out of control and you want some automation there, yes, uh, cruise the open source project cruise control is it can completely works uh, as is uh, with it as with typical open source Kafka and you can deploy it and use it for sake of your partition management. And then uh, some surprising cost customers would get is even though uh, MSK provides you uh, no charges for the data transfer between the broker nodes, there is some data transfer cost for the consumers that are consuming from your data, right? So when your consumers are consuming your data out of your Kafka clusters, there will be a data transfer charge. And uh, Kafka being a throughput-based system, it definitely comes up with a good number. And uh, we have from Kafka 2.4 onwards, open source, there is a feature called Rack Aware Replication mm -hmm. Selector, right? If you are choosing a... a uh, min, in min in sync replicas greater than two, or you have a, always an in sync replica, where in which your consumer is can directly fetch the message from the in sync replica instead of leader partition, right? So it it would try to fetch the data from an in sync replica that is within a same AZ instead of leader that might be in totally a different AZ. So that's gonna provide you a huge amount of saving in your data transfer costs because. Uh, when you enable this rack aware replica selector, the consumer would pick from the replica selector, the instinct replica within the same availability zone, right? So these are some of the options available to you to optimize your cost with MSK. And as I said, right, if your workload is not constant and you have very variable kind of workload and uh, you don't have an expertise on the partition management, then we do have a service MSK serverless, which would provide mm. you so many more options there. And we can definitely have a session on MSK serverless as we see more interest from the audience here. So that ends for ends the session for today, where we where we discussed about so many best practices about right sizing, securing, monitoring, and cost optimization. Thanks for attending the session, and we'd be happy to answer any more questions that's come up on the chat here. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Uh, a lot of a uh, lot of really good information. I know I learned some things today with this. Um, if anybody else, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat at this time. Um, so I don't know. It, do, do either of you kind of have any closing last minute 
recommendations uh, or or uh, things you want to share that we didn't get out uh, before we uh, wrap up today? Um, yeah, I think um, I yeah I've just got one. Like I said, I can get a bit um, passionate around the monitoring stuff and um, on workloads, but all I'm what I've seen is a lot of times when you're in trouble and you need to start firefighting and stuff. If you don't have the right observability, it's going to be chaos. For me, it's always important just to make sure you've got all the right visibility, even if you don't have to have all the metrics and stuff in place. Just have the basics in place because it will really help guide you. It's really important um, to have stuff like that in place. There, there are a few other Kafka level metrics, Kafka level best practices we couldn't get time to discuss. Something like ensure uh, your topic, uh, your each partition replication factor is three in your production, mm. and always have that min in sync replica is RF minus one. And uh, there, is, there is sometimes we see customer don't choose uh, something like. Um, uh, uh, unclean leader election this is one of the important where we yeah. see when you have an unclean leader election you need to know the side effect of that right so if you have a very critical data you should not enable that unclean leader election because when broker goes into maintenance uh, there could be some data loss so there are a few kafka level best practices uh, probably you might still need to follow um, yes we can have some some other session or talk about it and update our documentation and and we also cover a lot of that in our in our public documentation as well. Under exactly. That. Yeah. So they can check that out there. Cool. Great. Thank you uh, for this today. Um, so everyone, today we looked at uh, the operational best practices for Amazon managed streaming for Apache Kafka. Um, quite the mouthful. Um, hmm. If there's any questions that we didn't answer today, uh, you can post your questions over on repost.aws, where one of our experts, uh, our community would be uh, provide you with an answer to your question. Um, and it could even become a topic for one of our future shows here. Uh, so if you have feedback for us, please check the chat box on the right uh, for a link to our survey, or you can email us at aws supports you at amazon.com. We want to hear from you. Tell us what else you would like to see on the show. Um, thanks uh, again for taking the time today uh, for sharing all this with us, some really good information. So thanks for joining us at AWS Support You and happy cloud computing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.